Lawmakers in the Senate heard about a bill this afternoon that would require Marion County landlords to fix issues they were cited for at a property before renting it out again. 13 News State House reporter Emily Longnecker joins us with what happened to this particular bill. Emily? Lawmakers in the Senate Judiciary Committee voted 5 to 5 today, essentially killing this bill, but not before housing advocates and tenants told lawmakers that they believe there is a housing crisis in Indiana, one they are seeing and living. 5 to 5 does not pass. I'm living in my prison instead of a home. Maria Rodriguez Jr. told lawmakers she's living that crisis every day in her rental property in Columbus. A property Rodriguez said is infested with roaches. Now I'm bit up. My whole body is bit. Had Senate Bill 243 passed out of committee and eventually become law, it would not have helped Rodriguez, who lives in Bartholomew County. The bill was focused solely on Marion County and gave the Health and Hospital Corporation the ability to force landlords to fix issues in a property, even if someone had moved out or was evicted. So what this would do is it would allow us to tie the code violations to the property and not to the tenant. Right now, once a property is vacant, the code violation goes away and Health and Hospital has no way to follow through to make sure a problem gets fixed. Housing advocates who testified Thursday said they'd like to see all counties in Indiana have a way to force landlords to fix issues, not just Marion County, which accounts for 40 percent of the state's evictions. The other 91 counties account for 60 percent. Because there is such a shortage of housing in the state that unfortunately tenants are forced to go into really bad situations simply because there is nowhere to go. That's the situation Maria Rodriguez says she finds herself in right now, stuck between living with roaches. It's not okay. When I keep saying it's okay, it's not because I want to cry. Or being unhoused again because she can't afford to move but can't afford to stay. Our home is where our heart is. You're taking my soul away and saying I have a home. So Senate Bill 243 not getting out of committee today, but one of the bill's authors, Democratic Senator Andrea Hunley, telling me now there is a conversation on record, people telling lawmakers that there is a housing crisis in Indiana for safe and affordable housing. And a proposed alert for missing veterans and military service members who are at risk got one step closer to possibly becoming a reality. Our 13 News State House reporter Emily Longnecker has been following up with this. She's here now with the update. Emily. The House voted unanimously today for a bill that would create a green alert. It works the same way amber and silver alerts do, but instead of an alert for missing kids or older adults or at risk adults with disabilities, this alert would be for missing veterans or military members at risk. According to the bill's author, Representative Mitch Gore, a green alert would also help first responders who may approach a missing veteran in crisis differently than they would someone else. According to Representative Gore, Hoosier veterans are dying by suicide at a slightly greater rate than the national average. A 2020 report from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs showed there were over 6,000 veterans who died by suicide nationally. A 2021 report from the same department showed 139 Hoosier veterans died by suicide that year. We know that when veterans go missing, uh, thereafter, they're much more likely to die by suicide. Uh, oftentimes that's why you can't find them to begin with. And this bill says at a minimum, uh, we will come find you, we will get you help, and we will try to keep you here with us. This bill saw a lot of support from veterans who testified this week at the State House about why a green alert is so important. It now heads to the Senate where they'll have to decide if this bill receives a hearing in committee. And some advocacy groups in Indianapolis are pushing for a bill to allow inmates who are terminally ill to be released from prison. Our Angelica Robinson looked into this. She explains why what they call the compassionate release of prisoners will benefit the justice system. People who are in support of this bill say that criminals who don't pose a threat to public safety deserve to be with their families in their dying days. Senate Bill 291 would allow prisoners who are terminally ill, have a chronic medical condition, or are severely disabled to be released. Advocates for the compassionate release bill say too often people are dying in prison while waiting to be released on medical clemency, which requires the governor to sign off on. Under the proposed Senate bill, prisoners would be evaluated to see if they meet the criteria. Those who do can petition the court to modify their sentence. There are people sitting in there 
they're nonviolent people, uh, individuals who weren't sentenced to die in prison. Advocates say the release of those prisoners would save taxpayers dollars. We need to look at this from not only a fiscal standpoint of where our state resources are being allocated to, but as a human. While giving families a chance to spend their final days together. Reporting in Indianapolis, Angelica Robinson, 13 News. Last year, the same bill was introduced by the House, but it did not pass out of committee. We'll continue to follow where that goes this year. When life gives you lemons, do you pass lemonade legislation? Huh. Hmm. Some Indiana lawmakers think so. They do. 13 News State House reporter Emily Longnecker is here to explain. Emily? Well, this might come as a surprise to a lot of folks, but if a kid wants to have a lemonade stand here in Indiana, under current law, they have to have a permit and get an inspection from a county health department. Well, now a proposed law seeks to eliminate all that red tape and essentially deregulate the lemonade stand industry. It's about as American as apple pie, a rite of passage for a lot of kids. Selling lemonade on a hot summer day from a lemonade stand in their yards. Democratic Representative Blake Johnson thinks lemonade stands also provide an important lesson to kids. You think about how can we help teach kids early skills around financial literacy, around business and entrepreneurship. Johnson filed a bill this session that would allow kids to run a lemonade stand on their private property without a permit or inspection. A neighborhood homeowners association would also be prohibited from weighing in. The bill passed out of committee Tuesday unanimously. What we're doing today is removing that restriction, making it clear that if a kid wants to have a lemonade stand, uh, they can do so now in Indiana. Like any bill, though, there's no guarantee it will make it over the finish line. Two years ago, Republican Representative Jim Pressel filed the exact same bill after a concerned dad called him about the current law regulating lemonade stands. Pressel says filing the bill turned into a civics lesson for some of his young constituents. This has to do a lot with um, teaching our kids uh, how to deal with the change you want to affect. They also learned change can be slow to come. Yes. The House passed the bill unanimously, but it never got a committee hearing in the Senate, so it died. This session, lemonade stands are back in business, at least where the legislative process is concerned. Representative Pressel, a Republican, now working to support Representative Johnson, a Democrat, on this bill. Representative Pressel saying it's a good example of working across the aisle on this issue. So, so far, bipartisan support for deregulating the lemonade stand industry. We'll see what the full House has to say later this week at the State House. Emily Longnecker, 13 News. Oh, right. Look at that bipartisan support. You don't yes. see a lot of that. I very wish often. that it would happen on some other tougher topics, mm. and I wish they wouldn't have to spend so much time on something like this. Yeah. All right? Yeah. I'm just we'll trying to figure least. out what I would say if a county came up to me, a government official, and said, Your kid can't have a lemonade stand. You don't have a permit. Yeah. What? Well, hopefully, right. they won't be saying yeah. that. A little over an hour ago, the state Senate passed a bill addressing the reading scores of Hoosier third graders. Current stats show one in five Indiana students cannot read by the end of third grade. That's not good. 13 News State House reporter Emily Longnecker is here with a debate that surrounds this bill to fix that problem. Emily. Well, both sides agree that those statistics show that Indiana has a crisis when it comes to kids being able to read. How to fix the literacy issue, though, is where the debate starts. Under Senate Bill 1, all school districts would be required to give the I-Read exam to second graders instead of third graders. If a student fails the test in second grade, schools would be required to provide help and summer school, but students wouldn't be required to go. Students who take the I-Read test again in third grade and fail will be held back. The bill's author says this is not a retention bill, but says that may be needed. While some may say that retention is not good for the child, let's think about this. What isn't good is to move a student on without foundational reading skilled. There are some exceptions to holding a student back. Kids with special needs or who speak English as a second language could be exempt, along with students who've already been held back twice before they reach the third grade. Under the bill, schools must create an appeals process for parents if they believe their child should not be held back. Those who voted against the bill took issue with the mandatory retention part of it, saying school districts needed more time to implement the science of reading requirements passed by the legislature last session. Now is not the time for this specific legislation that includes the hammer of retention. 
We're taking away the discretion of our school administrators and our parents by implementing this blanket approach. We know that literacy is a top priority on both sides of the aisle. It's also at the top of Governor Holcomb's agenda this session. The debate, though, uh, on the literacy issue coming with very different viewpoints. We saw that today uh, in the Senate. Now the bill heads to the House where lawmakers there will decide if it gets a committee hearing. Here's some video of spinning. Local police call it a phenomenon fueled in no small part by social media. For more than a year here in central Indiana, we've been tracking the sharp rise in street takeovers in our community. Yeah, these people shut down traffic as these cars drive around in circles. And our state house reporter Emily Longnecker tonight shows us the push by state lawmakers to shut down these takeovers. Emily. It's called spinning, and there's a proposed law to try and stop it from happening. Local law enforcement came to the State House today to show their support for Senate Bill 240, which would increase the penalties for street takeovers and the spinning that comes with them. This is what you'll see after a street takeover happens skid marks showing the passive vehicles that block traffic only to go in circles. And this is what that looks like. Video taken last summer during one of the many street takeovers IMPD responded to. It's reckless. It's, you know, frankly, it's stupid. And, uh, you know, it has to stop. And IMPD's interim police chief, Chris Bailey, thinks Senate Bill 240 is a good start. And the message needs to get to the individuals that are participating, that are organizing these events. We now have new tools, new laws that we can take your car from you and we can hold you more accountable for your actions. Under the bill, if someone is injured during a street takeover, the people taking part in it are automatically looking at prison time. If you're caught a second time, say goodbye to your vehicle. Police say street takeovers aren't just dangerous for the people doing them. When we have to deal with people that are doing things voluntarily and putting themselves and others in danger that takes our officers from our communities where they need to be. Also under the bill, if you're involved in a street takeover and try to run from police using your vehicle, you'll also automatically be facing prison time. It just needs to be a higher penalty so people, they understand if they flee, they're going to go to prison. Johnson County Sheriff Dwayne Burgess says his deputies have seen more people coming into Johnson County who are running away from police from somewhere else. He thinks Senate Bill 240 could help deter that. Don't come our way because uh, we're going to work with the prosecutor and we're going to try to send you to prison. So certainly uh, widespread support from law enforcement on Senate Bill 240. It passed out of committee this morning and now heads to the full Senate for a second look where changes can still be made at the State House. Emily Longnecker, 13 News. And state lawmakers have also taken other action on a number of bills. For example, the Senate passed a bill regulating when kids can use cell phones during school hours. That now is headed to the House.